I'm going to think that Sharath is nodding affirmatively. Um, so there we go. Um, all right, folks, welcome to Wine Foundry Wednesdays. Are we recording, Teresa? All right, great. Welcome to Wine Foundry Wednesdays, folks. I am Steve Ryan, the general manager and CEO of the Wine Foundry. And I'm here with my trusted colleagues, my camera person, Teresa. Um, at home, our director of winemaking, Patrick Sabo, who was at the winery very early today to make some pressing decisions, which we'll discuss a little later. So he's at home now enjoying some, some wine to still kind of you know, decide what he's gonna do next on. And then he'll probably go to sleep early to be back here early in the morning. We've got Stuart out in the barrel room currently having technical difficulties. Either that or he's fallen into a barrel and just decided it's a nicer place to spend the remainder of 2020. So, and, uh, and Philip, his camera person out there is uh, either helping him or they're just, you know, downing the whole barrel. So tonight we are going to uh, brush up a little bit on fermentation, what we've covered the last couple of sessions and get into extended maceration and pressing and the decisions and the mechanics that, that make all of that possible and the decisions that, um, you know, that really ultimately Patrick and his team need to make. So um, right now, I've got uh, 2017 Rogers Creek Pinot Noir, Sonoma Coast. This is from our foundry lineup. And this is, this is beautiful. It's actually, I, I personally really enjoy Central Coast Pinot Noir and Burgundian Pinot Noirs, Oregon Pinot Noirs. Cent uh, Sonoma Coast Pinot Noirs are usually a little riper for me, but this one is quite pretty. Um, it's, got a, it's got really incredible notes on the nose, really getting some great uh, lush red fruit, not overly ripe. Um, so I'm getting some really nice kind of raspberry flavors and, uh, and some current in there. And um, a quick review of fermentation as we, as we go through this. The last session, we talked a lot about um, yeast eating sugar, creating CO2, alcohol, different temperatures, and how uh, it's all about manipulation uh, that, that the winemaker has in the fermentation process to really take what is a natural process and manipulate it to his or her um, desired outcome. So tonight we're gonna continue along that line, but we're gonna focus more on wine style. And so all of the decisions that are coming forward in extended maceration or in uh, pressing decisions, when to press the grapes and, and get, the, get the wine off of the skins. And with that, we're really talking more about red wines. Um, tonight we'll also focus a little bit on Cabernet Sauvignon because we'll get into that. Um, but it's all about style and how, how those different things kind of those decisions impact uh, what you're going to end up tasting in your glass. If you're a client of ours that makes wine, uh, customized wine by the barrel, then you're going to understand um, how we are able to achieve uh, the style that you're looking for. So um, I, I hear some air in the background. Stu, is that you? It is. Um, I basically I got a phone call right when we were starting, and we've discovered something new that uh, a phone call can can kick you off of uh, off of Zoom. So that's so a phone call is how you get off Zoom. So lesson learned in uh, late October of 2020. So it, while, at while least on my phone. Perfect. So while we um, have you here, we were talking about Pinot Noir. I didn't know if Stu was going to be back there. Stu's in the barrel room right now. Um, Stu, are you with the 2020 barrels of Pinot? Yeah, actually, uh, I've got four of them behind me. So, um, and it, you're not, you're not really gonna be able to tell this too much, but basically we're, we're going into a variety of different oaks, uh, oak barrels. So four different coopers and two new barrels, a neutral barrel and a once used. We're really going to get into what that means in the next episode, but Steve was talking us through the 2017 Pinot um, that I was tasting silently by myself. That is a finished wine. This wine was harvested, these grapes were harvested on 9-15, September 15th. And they were, uh, before they came here, they were fermented in one of the stainless steel tanks like you're gonna be seeing or you know, with, with my colleagues, uh, Steve will be standing by one. Uh, and so that's where we initiate fermentation. Why stainless? Well, stainless steel is non-reactive, so it is not contributing aroma and flavor, and we can uh, really dial in the temperature uh, because we, have, we can adjust the temperature on those tanks. Another thing about stainless steel kind of goes unheralded, but you can clean it really easily, so it really minimizes uh, 
vectors for microbial taint. So really, really good for fermentation. And then what happened was Patrick, after fermentation took place, then Patrick kept it on the skins for a short period of time. Um, we'll get into extended maceration in just a second. And he was tasting every day with the team. And then it was like, now we're ready to press the wine. And that's how it got into here. So I'm going to ch check out the, the 20. And you can see that the, the bung that we're using, and I don't know how clear this will be on the screen, but we have a two-part bung here. And, and that's because the wine is finishing up something called the mallow lactic conversion. There's a kind of acid that we're going to be learning about in, on, on November 11th called malic acid, which is being converted to lactic acid. And there's some, by, some gas byproducts there. And so that's why we have the two-part bung to allow those gases to escape. I'm just going to thieve in to the barrel. Now what you're tasting at home is going to be really, uh, uh, you know, it's a finished wine. What I'm going to be tasting here, obviously just a little, little baby. And it's almost like there's a mask. Like I wasn't getting, I'm not, you're not really evaluating the aromatics right now. That's what it's, it's not about aromatics right now. It's about trying to assess the palate, really. And it's really, really polished and smooth in the front of the palate. But over the coming months, that weight will shift back and the wine will just feel heavier and much more lush and rich in the back end of the palate. So that's, that's kind of like the 2020. It smells right now, just smells kind of like berry-ish um, and kind of berries and cherries. Um, but we'll get a lot more depth once it really starts to pick up that oak and just as it kind of finishes up mallow lactic conversion. So now, um, uh, Steve, I believe you are, uh, next episode, we'll, we'll talk about mallow lactic conversion. Steve, I think you're talked, um, you're, you're kind of perched right now at a tank, if I understand. And I think you're, you're are you with, at Foxtrot? And then you're going to be kind of figuring out when to press that wine. I know we were tasting it earlier today. Patrick, you might have a sample at your house. The big question is, why are we doing extended maceration and when are we going to do it? Steve and Patrick, can you guys take over? Yeah. I'm, am I on? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'll do, well, so Patrick can answer this um, a lot more thoroughly than I can, but I'm just going to, while, while we're kind of talking about this, um, we got a preemptive question from Todd in San Diego and Todd is asking, he saw the temperature behind us here and he's asking why we do 85 degrees. Patrick, that might be fast forwarding, but do you want to just get into it and maybe in your, in your response, you can answer Todd? Well, for sure. The, you know, do that, still... I'm going to go ahead and pull a little, pull a little wine here. Very good. So Steve, when does the, when do we harvest these grapes? I expect mute. you to know. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I, that's okay. Am I am I still on mute? No, you're not. You're not muted now. You're good now. But I, I was just testing you there because you're standing by the tank. But so these okay, these I grapes, think it was. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. No, no. I I think you know better than I do. <laughs> so 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 typically with Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, it depends. You know, this year is a little bit different. We didn't do quite as long of extended mass of of a uh, cold soak as we might because of the uh, potential. Uh, of, of changing the wine. So I wanted to do a reasonably shorter time frame this year, but generally you're doing a two to four, three or four day cold soak. So that's about 50 degrees. And then the fermentation takes place, you know, you warm it up to closer to in, in 70 degrees and, and, or 80, and then they can peak out anywhere in the 80 to 90 range. And so what happens with temperature is the more temperature, the, the faster and the more of everything you get. So you're looking for more extraction or for it to go faster then you want more heat and so there's a balance so of get building the right amount of extraction and um because what happens is now too because now you have alcohol so the, the fox trout is now dry I mean the sugar the alcohol fermentation is complete so now we're waiting to decide as you mentioned Stu and, and Steve we're waiting on the right time to press 
So uh, what happens in this page usually is that the tannins are all on the front and sides of the palate, but there's very little from the mid to back. So we're looking for a little bit more chewiness to the wine. And so that what's happening, there's a lot of chemistry that's happening, but more lover, if you taste the wine every day, you sense the way that the wine's shifting. And so the tan, the, the wine tends to be a little bit more in front and sides. And I'm trying to migrate that, that sensation to more into the mid and back of the palate. And so it, over time with temperature in the 80-ish degrees, 80s degrees, you can gain more and more extraction to a point. And so we're looking for that point. And so you're trying to project because we have to plan ahead of time. You have to schedule the pressing, you know, usually a day or two or four in, in advance. And so I need to know that through experience, you've learned when to take the dish off the off the fire if you're cooking, you know. And so it's, it's knowing when that time is. And it's just a matter of tasting and evaluating, tasting and evaluating, using your previous experience to guide you through that that process. But Cabernet, I might leave on the skins and up an extra, sometimes one, two, three uh, weeks or more longer than the primary was. So primary fermentation is usually done in by day 10 to day 14. And so um, anywhere after that, and so you can leave it on the skins. Now we're on day, I think we're on day 18 or 19 now uh, for Foxtrot. So we're, we've already been several days on the skins, you know, extra. And so I'm just trying to decide again each day. It's is it ready yet? Is it ready? And each day, you wouldn't think you would think that it wouldn't be. Some people don't think there's going to be an amazing difference day after day. But if you think about the percentage difference of age that wine is, if it's only 15 days old and you go one more day, that's seven percent older than it was the day before. And so the wine, especially with heat, has moved that much farther along in its progression. And you have to decide as a winemaker, is it how far enough? you know, is enough and when are we ready? And that's something that's easy to um, explain. It has to come through judgment and, and experiment. And so we fix, how many experiments have we done now, Steve, would you say? Um, I, I think we're up to 18 million and four <laughs> now. But I think so with, with what Patrick's saying here, you know, it's interesting because and first of all, for those that aren't familiar, Foxtrot is a, a vineyard property we source Cabernet Sauvignon from. Uh, 2019 was the first year we did it. 2020, this is our second vintage. We're extremely pleased with the property. It's it's uh, right in the center of Oakville, right? Um, kind of almost right behind Oakville Grocery, um, between kind of Oakville Grocery and, and Plump Jack and Groff right there. It's on Money Road. Just north um, of Silver Oak, yeah, right? Just right across yeah. from Silver Oak, right? Exactly. And so, so we kind of lucked into the property last year and we weren't sure if we were going to be able to get it again this year. And we were able to, um, and I, and it looks like we'll be able to get it moving forward. So, so Patrick and what I'm, so what I'm tasting right now, and this is my second taste because the first one I actually picked up the wrong glass and it was Pinot. And I thought you really had, <laughs> uh, you really maybe water back that cab a little bit, but, um, so now on this, you think what would your decision be to press on this when do you think you're going to go because i don't think you mentioned this and forgive me if you did but one of the winemakers and this is this is really where the art comes in for a winemaker beyond the science is that and you can only get this based on experience is that patrick needs to project forward in his mind years down the road and say okay this tastes great right now but in another four days it's going to taste great for where it'll be in four or five years Right. So, so what would yeah, you, what, I did, what's your I, I take? touched a little bit on that. I touched a little bit more so on the scheduling of it, but you're absolutely right. That's one of the most difficult parts of winemaking is aiming way down the road or some far or some distance, at least down the road. And depending on the style of the wine and, and the, the thirstiness of the client, uh, the, uh, and the, the impatience of the client, you know, where it might be ready sooner or not. So we're looking for, it's very difficult though, to go, think six years down the road, this is going to be the perfect wine, you know, so you have to have so, had, had that six years of experience, of course, to know whether that judgment six years back was right or not, or and or where it fits in this, you know, so that you can adjust for each decision going forward. So, and that, and that goes into the wine style conversation, right? So like, if we say, say, um, you know, Joe Galanti, a client of ours, just to use an example, um, he likes a little bit more restrained tannins. He likes 
um, a little bit more acid. So getting into the wine style side of things, that's where he likes it. Um, but then, but then Rick, I'm not going to say his last name is a chef, but Rick, uh, sorry, uh, I went down this wrong road. I shouldn't have gone down, but, um, but Rick likes big power house cabs. And so, um, with that, like that, that gets into the stylistic decisions of how you're going to make these calls. And then also what the best property is for them to fit into. Is that fair? Very fair. I'd say, yeah. So there's, there's definitely, and there's ways to shape one particular, you know, um, property into multiple different styles and or depending on some some properties more so than others but you really can do as you know as i ever i think probably everyone especially if they've if they are client they know a tiniest little bit of cabernet franc shifts the palate quite a bit and for the good or the bad depends on the person judging you know so I mean, there's a lot of ways to go for sure from there um, so, so um patrick real quick Steve, oh sorry, oh, Stu. I was gonna, I was just gonna ask if, if you saw the uh, the question from Timothy that had just come in. Uh, I'll just toss it out to you guys. Hey, uh, so Timothy wants to know no city on that, but is there okay, would there on. be a reason not to do extended maceration, or are there wineries that don't do extended maceration? There are there are some reasons to do it. There might a lot of them might be logistics. Uh, says so is can be one of the main re you know. Uh, Actual reason can be just that they need that tank quite a bit. It's if, if you're a restaurant, you might want to turn and burn if tables perhaps to be able to get enough people through. And so if that the other reason they might not want to do it is if they had decided to add a lot of tannins to begin with, perhaps. So if they were a winemaker that chose to do a lot of products on the upfront that they didn't need to do extended maceration perhaps to gain that some of that because they either blended some uh, other varieties into it, or they had put in some other products. So there's a couple other reasons why you might want to do it. But if I'd say if you're using the same recipe, um, uh, most people, I'd say not everyone, and it also depends on the style of, of wine that you're looking for. If you're not looking for a bigger, chewier wine, if you're looking for a, a more restrained wine, then that would mean the reason to do less extended maceration in general. And so um, indoor wine that's, that drinks a little bit more front in the palate. So if that was something that you preferred, then that would be a reason not to do it. I'd say indoor, a little bit lighter across the palate and less um, intense. And so if, again, if that's an, if that's a wine style that you prefer, then I think that would be the reason to do it. But if you're looking for a new world, fuller bodied, you know, tannic kind of a nap a cab, I don't think that's. I think extended maceration, at least to a, a point, would be you now whether that point is three days as opposed to 23 days that again depends on the style of wine and the and how much you needed to do and the winemaker's judgments in the in the client it's all those things that go into it it's not so Stu, are you over the press now or are you getting a, some different press cuts quick actually before we get into that do you mind if i we, we've got a series of questions that are coming in i just want to make sure we we hit them Very good. um sure uh, so uh simone wilson from orange county uh, Dana Point, Simone I think is, I, I, I'm, I'm calling woman. him Simone Love because him. there was a typo on this lovely woman, British, British woman. Uh, what would be the outcome of more or less extraction, Patrick? More or less extractions of what you have. So again, depends on what you have to extract. And so the, the, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about, there's, there is a, there's a, there's a max kind of tannins that you could extract from the wine. So there is not something if you went indefinitely, you wouldn't just keep going indefinitely. You can, there is a, there's a finite amount. So you gain, there's a lot of compounds. It's not just tannins that you're extracting. You're extracting all kinds of everything that's there will be, you know, will be extracted. Alcohol is a solvent, of course. And with heat, you're going to be extracting all those things from the, from the skins. And so less extraction is less, of course, and more is more and to a point. You know, uh, again, there is a maximum, but you would definitely gain more bitterness, more. And so if you're not looking for all the bitterness and or uh, say, for example, the skins were still green or they're at a vegetalness or at herbalness, you'd gain more of those things as well. You'd gain a little bit of you'd gain everything you have. And so if you want more of what you got, then more is better, I guess. So uh, and, and you would also you, you risk the danger of extra extracting from the seeds, too. Right. And that's kind of where you were going as well. Yes? Bitter. Yeah. Yeah. They go. It goes bitter and bitter on the palate. And right. the palate gets kind of focused and angular 
uh, because of those C10s. All right, so uh, real quick, I'm gonna do um, two or three more of these before we get into the next thing. So this next question sure. is uh, from uh, Anani Mouse. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mouse, or I can, uh, hopefully I can just call you Anani. Um, moving the tannins to the back of the mouth, is there a chemical equivalent that can be monitored or is this the art versus the science? Yeah, Patrick, it's all, yeah. Patrick, you want to grab it just in terms of polymerization? <laughs> you, want to take, you want to take it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, there are definitely, I, I don't have the capability, unfortunately, to, uh, to monitor it the way that there are definitely ways to monitor tannin development and which, and which compounds you have at different points. And there are, there are um, because I'm not a biochemist, I'm not going to be the, I don't want it to be the one to, uh, to give the lesson on it, but essentially the tannins are, are, are linking together to form larger chain uh, compounds that affect more of the, of the, of the sides and back of your palate. And so I'm looking well, we, for, but I, but I use my palate to determine uh, there are ways to use to, your palate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there were there are ways. It's probably a pretty expensive machine, uh, but as, as most of them are, I'm sure there are ways to quantify things to be able to try to to shoot for. I don't know again though that there's not certain chemistry or certain numbers. You can't necessarily look at a number and go, "Oh, that wine I like." You can look at numbers and say that wine, you know, in general, those chemistry is clean, is safe or not safe or you can kind of draw generalities or, or, you know, but you can't know, I don't know by looking at the numbers. So that was the most amazing wine I've ever tasted because that's not the way that it is, you know, um, and not, not even if I knew the, the tannin numbers or the, uh, all the different compound numbers, I think you'd have to, you, you but your palate knows right away whether it is or doesn't work. And so that's what And anonymous, anonymous, like we're not dodging the question. It's, like sometimes a pH level, if I'm if we shift into acid of three, four, five, three point four five, doesn't taste like a uh, a pH of three, four, five. Sometimes it tastes like a three, five, four. So so that's why when we're always talking about tasting uh, is the most important thing. Actually doing the sensory analysis because that's what humans are going to be tasting. Um, and look, yeah, and we I embrace technology. We embrace uh, chemistry, but ultimately it boils down to what's actually happening within the taster's mouth. Exactly. And I, I think um, that's 100% correct. So it is really more the art than the science, which was Anani Mouse's um, the end of the question. And it's absolutely the art, of the, the art over the science and it's trusting your winemaker. Um, so uh, that and trusting their palate and their experience. Um, so real quick, we're gonna do one more here before moving on. And um, so Tracy Sutton, are you still punching down during extended maceration while you're waiting for it to be ready for pressing? It's a good question, Tracy. Um, no, we're not actually pushing, we're punching down or pumping over um, during the extended maceration in general. Sometimes I do choose to do a slight wetting of the cap and so um, just to keep things, but I, but I actually do um, keep things fresh on top. And it's a good question because uh, when you, basically the wine is protected by the cap, you know, the grapes are all up to, still up at the top of the fermentation. And so the wine is down below that. And so we're really only extracting the bottom, at that point now, the bottom layer of the must and, and any seeds and other uh, things that have fallen to the bottom. So you're really only getting a small amount of, of, of extraction at that point. That's why we want to keep the, that's why I like to keep the heat up at that and do a period of time uh, to get there. It does take longer to do it this way. This is kind of the slow and low and long time frame. That's a luxurious position to be in because if you had to turn that tank over quickly, you, you couldn't necessarily afford to do this. On Cabernet, they're usually at the very end of the, of the harvest, so we don't have fruit coming in so it can stay as long as we'd like it to in tank other you know so at this point i'm just you know just waiting for the right time but we want to keep that cap fresh and so we actually we, we suspend dry ice bags over the top of the fermentation of the cap to keep the space the head space as anaerobic as possible to minimize any type of bacterial spoilage that might happen if it was just open to the elements so uh, but we don't do any yep. additional 
pump overs because at that point we've already probably done, you know, 30 or 40 pump over or punch downs on the line over those first two weeks of its life. And so we've expected quite a bit at this point now. I just need the chemistry to take to catch up with it. And so that's really what it is. It's a waiting game. And so, anyways. so I, well, I was, Patrick, you mentioned uh, dry ice bags. And so I was actually my my little uh, my, my table, my wine, my wine co console here tonight is uh, is a dry ice bin. So it's actually I was going to show you folks that, uh, you know, something that happens in the winery all the time. And it's probably it's quite possibly one of the most expensive ingredients <laughs> pound for pound uh, that we use in the winery. So just to, just to show you what Patrick's talking about, we literally do um, use dry ice right here. You, uh, you can all see it. And, uh, and we have about anywhere from four to eight of these big bins delivered a week. And we're constantly dry icing uh, the bags to keep CO2 on top of it, keep the oxygen away off the cap. And that's what Patrick was talking about. I just thought since this was here, I'd show you a little, you know, behind the curtain kind of thing. Um, and uh, so, Stu, you're, you're, we, we, I know we have more questions, and we're gonna, I'm gonna, some of them aren't quite to the extent of maceration piece, so we're gonna put them a little later in the, in the, in the episode here. Um, but Stu, you're that's over good. by the press. I am over by the press, and Steve, I just want to let you know, in terms I, I, of, I'm, I'll meet uh, you at the press in a sec, but I'm listening. Well, I was just going to tell you, in terms of COVID spacing, uh, it, you might just take a look at where we are because it's going to be it'd be a little crowded. Uh, so just think about that when you're coming over. So, um, hello everybody. I am uh, Stu over by the press. So that once Patrick makes that call, that okay, you know what? We've got that tannin polymerization. We have the pallet weight. The tannins are weighty enough. Then we're going to press. And behind me, I have our bladder press, a Euro press. Shroth, if you want to fire up the video, the video, first video of the press, I'll kind of walk folks through it. You see me, maybe you see me holding these red cups, but Shroth, if you could. So once we have, uh, once Patrick makes that call, then what we're going to do is the first thing we'll do is we'll siphon off what's called that free run. And that was that juice that Patrick was kind of referring to that's under the cap. It's not attached to the skin. It runs free. So it is free run. And that tends to be a little bit lighter in wine style because we're not pressing against the skin. So it's a little more berry driven, less, uh, less sturdy. Then once those grapes get tossed into the press, then the magic really starts happening. And I have right here, I have the free run juice. And from, uh, from a 2020 cab that was pressed today from, uh, from uh, an area, I guess it's Pritchard Hillish area. It's just Napa Valley AVA. And if I taste this, a little bit lighter in style, uh, smoother. But for me, and some wineries kind of make the mistake, they're like, oh, free run, since it hasn't been pressed, that has to be better. No, it's just different. And for my palate, I think free run's beautiful, but it can be kind of a one trick pony. And then, Trot, if you want to kind of fire up, uh, uh, if you want to, if you want to fire up the second video, then then what happens is, then there's a bladder inside this press, and we can we can control it. Uh, we will increase, we'll we'll start the, start inflating the bladder to 0.2 bars of pressure. If you remember back to high school, a bar is one atmosphere. 14.5 pounds per square inch. So if we, if we start inflating the bladder to 0.2 bars of pressure, it's not going to be a lot of pressure, just a little bit. But pressing those skins, we will be extracting that word that Simone kind of uh, handed to us before, a little bit more structure, a little bit more power. Steve, are you also tasting the press fractions from today? I am, Stu. Thank you. Um, 
and that's a great thing a nod back to simone we're gonna keep calling her simone tonight um yeah i am i just tried the free run and then i just tried the point two and i'd also like to tell you Stu. i think as we know uh one bar is actually equivalent to 14.508 pounds per square inch you forgot the but we don't want to get too Okay, thank you, Mr. Scientist. I really, I really appreciate that, Mr. Fourteen point seven pounds per square inch. No, uh, <laughs> um, but what, Steve? Do you, I mean, you can taste a difference uh, between the, the free run and the point two? Yes. Oh I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. You actually want me to contribute to the conversation? I totally get it. I thought I thought we were just <laughs> going to talk about Simone. Um, so yes, one hundred percent. You can absolutely taste the difference. The free run is is luscious, fruit forward. Like, it's really delicious. I mean, I could take it home and, and drink it. I mean, that's like, it would be it would be fantastic. The point two gets a little bit more grip. It, it's kind of like going, uh, it's kind of like going to grad school, right? Like, you, you've kind of got your, your undergrad and then you're stepping it up a little bit more. Um, you're only a little bit of the way there, but it's still, um, let me make sure I have the right one. I mean, it's a really noticeable, noticeable point on the palate. It's shaping more on the middle of the palate, and it's starting to creep out into the back of the palate. Um, but it's, it's not quite there by any stretch in the back of the palate, but it's starting to shape out a little bit more. It's inflated a little bit more in the middle of the palate. Is that, is that fair, Stu? And, yeah, ab absolutely. And I haven't, I haven't gone to the plate yet, but if you saw, if the video is playing in the background and you got to see inside of it, you see that there's a balloon uh, a canvas balloon for all intent that goes in there and presses against those skins. And then the drum rotates and each press fraction, the free run, the point two, falls into that press pan, that drip tray. And then Patrick will kind of put them, will blend them accordingly going into barrel. Because Steve said, hey, well, that, that free run is so drinkable. Well, yes, it is. It's drinkable right now, but it might this wine's going to be in barrel for two years. So we might want to put some of the lighter press fractions, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 with it, maybe a little 0 0.6, 0 0.8, uh, a little bit, a little bit more power and structure every single time we, we, we hit those. Skins. Steve, I'm going to taste the 0.8 right now. Um, yeah, you, you do that. I, we've got a bunch of questions coming in, so I might, I might jump can on you, one of these. Yeah. Send, send them on, what? send them on over. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Okay, That's a good one. To, I, actually, you know what? We're going to, we're going to, uh, and Phil, Phil Gurren, thank you so much for the kind, kind words. Um, Phil Gurren is just basically saying that the wine is elegant, delicious and interesting and, um, let the wine lead you and not overpower you. So thank you, Phil. Um, and, uh, the other, the, the next few I'm going to, um, uh, uh, Simone, Simone thinks we're funny. <laughs> Um, but we're going to, uh, we're, we'll get to the next view after, after the segment, but this, uh, while I've got the mic hot here, Stu and Patrick, um, this kind of continues to go back into wine style. So I, I'm going to keep drumming this home that it's all Please about do. wine style. So press, press factions are also about wine style. So whether it's free run 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, or now we're going to go to the 0.8 bar of pressure, um, you know, which is what, 11 something PSI in the balloon. Um, so that while we we have these things that we can mitigate to be able to get you the barrel you want, I think is, is kind of where what we're illustrating. So Stu, how are you on the point eight now? So I don't know if you just saw, but you know, I, I, uh, I was kind of unconsciously licking my lips and kind of, you know, I had a little bit of peanut butter mouth um, because okay. it's a little chewier. A, a, yes, a, a, again, because yeah. um, it's a little bit chewier. And then we do that balancing act. And you'll see if, when you come to the barrel room that you'll see press barrels or light press barrels. And it's all about, age, you know, as we're aging, Patrick's tasting, and then he is making decisions accordingly. You'll always hear about, uh, he'll kind of, we often use the analogy of like a photograph on a particular day. Some young winemakers make a mistake of they taste a barrel on October 28th or April 4th, and they love it on that day, and they think, okay, this is right. 
But then you make the mistake of, no, the wine is, is that is just one snapshot on one day because the wine is a moving target. So the, the, the main thing is identifying the style you want right away so that over the course of the trajectory of that wine, Cabernet, two years, Pinot Noir, maybe 14 months, 16 months in barrel, depending on the style, um, we will be making decisions, the team and the seller, to shape aroma, flavor, structure. Sorry for that long-winded ramble right there, but I hope that made sense. No, that, that, that's good. Um, we do have another thing from um, Anani Mouse, uh, and this is for Patrick. I just read an article about a psalm that lost their scent ability. Is this something you can ensure considering your livelihood is utilizing your senses? Ooh, it might be a COVID-19 kind of deal. It's a nonsense question. Yeah, I mean, Pat, Patrick, had, he, his nose is insured for $8.47, um, <laughs> which is uh, fantastic. Which is like four, hey, bucks, Patrick, four, so, four bucks less than it should be. You know, but I, I think a fair thing to say with that would be, look, we took very extensive, we took really serious protocols in here uh, during, you know, Steve, I even told you, don't come over by the press right now, even though we were going to be doing some, because, uh, you know, a, a team member is about eight feet away. So we had to protect Patrick during harvest because his nose knows, and we didn't want to jeopardize that opportunity of shutting down at our, at our, at our you know, critical path of, um, well, I, you know, I would of, say when we're, we're making the one. We're continuing to protect Patrick as well, because we kind of need him. Um, but that's while, why he's making, he's are, working from home while we are on this. Um, and, uh, and so now I'm going to just go to a, these other questions that I, that I kind of run through, ran through earlier. And I just don't, I want to make sure I'm not missing one. Um, so Heather Got Parks, it. good to see you again, Heather. Um, how can you assure consistency year over year? Um, I think this is a great talk for Patrick to really talk about kind of year over year consistency is it possible and if not why you know it's possible within within uh particularly um fortunately in, in the area that we are um the, the the weather is very consistent and so you know we're very fortunate to have the year after year after year similar conditions and so if you have same people making similar decisions in similar conditions then you can and have a similar theory type you know product to start with and so starting with the with a similar um starting with a similar product to begin the grapes that are, are definitely the critical aspect of it because i can i know that i have all and i can i can control all the things that happen in the winery to a point and so it's more it's less less easy for me to control the things as not at all to control the things that happen in the vineyard you know, not just not from the farming side, but from the nature side of things, of course, more, more, more importantly. And so even on the, on the farming side, I can, can control a lot of the things that happen with that as well. Or if someone, you know, we can, we can control them in general. So we're able to, to um, ensure cons consistency, assuming you, you had a consistently good product, you want to continue with that same consistency <laughs> over and over and over again. Now, if you did it wrong to start with, you obviously wouldn't want to consistently miss, make that same mistake. So you have to adjust as accordingly but once you've developed a rhythm that you feel is one you want to maintain then of course you need to know why how what got you there and how you continue to to perform that way again in the future so it's critical to um to do it a lot of times and to pay attention and to take lots of notes and to reflect and to be honest and uh that way you can make a a, a consistent product year after year after year but it's only through be through a ton of careful thoughtfulness that happens that way it's not by mistake for sure um of course, and then Steve, hey, patrick can i jump in with the, with a stewism really quick as well yeah. uh so um because some wineries might want to their wine to taste a little bit different each year because they want their 2018 to taste like 2018 their 2017 like they want it to be a represented uh, representation of the vintage. And by example, 2010, 2011 were very cool vintages here. Uh, we've had a string of really warm ones. And so it just depends on what the story 
uh, of your winery is. And it kind of, again, it goes back to wine style. Are you aiming for consistency or are you looking to your, for your wines to be an expression of time and place? Is that a fair yeah, thing so to kind of toss in there as well? Totally. I, I think that's extremely fair. And I, I think that in California from 2012 through 2020, and granted, we had a little bit of a stunted harvest and certainly a lower yield this year um, in 2020. However, we've had the best opportunity for consistency over, you know, a 10 harvest year. You know, what are we in nine years? Ever. So, so 10 harvest, right? I think ever in California, at least in Napa Valley um, in Northern California, I should say. So, yeah, we've had the best opportunity for it, but there are differences between 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 17 and 18 and so on. And so you, you absolutely get into those nuances and, and people applaud them both. But I think it's really a just a delightful thing when, when you can really just sort of let it go. And yes, you know, you can have great wine. So from 2012 through 2020, the wines are killer. That's hands down. So now you're getting into splitting hairs. And so what's your preference? You know, maybe you like 13 more than 14 because it's mildly more extracted and 14 was a, a larger vintage in, as far as yields. And so, but maybe you like more of that kind of fruit forwardness that 14 gave over 13. So that's the stuff that I think wine is really a sense of place and time, most importantly in time. And, um, and, and it really sparks those conversations. So that, that would be my contribution. Um, yeah, but uh, hey Steve, there's quick, one more. Uh, there's one more question yeah. about what are you what are you doing with that spray bottle behind you? Yeah, so I was just going to get to that from David. Yeah, so um, the question is, I see Steve using that's me. Uh, a lot of precautions to prevent contamination with the spray bottle. What is the danger with unwanted microbial in long maceration? So, uh, good question, David. Pretty much. What we, have, what we have going for us right now um, to prevent contamination is the alcohol level in the wine. At this stage, we've converted, we've gone through primary, we have a good amount of alcohol in there. So it's actually for a few reasons. So he saw, he saw me spraying this, this is 75% ethanol. So it, uh, is, uh, it's almost like Everclear pretty much. Um, and uh, I spray it on this sample cock here <clears throat> that um, A, it's going to keep the bugs and the fruit flies away from coming and trying to climb up there because they see sticky goodness and all of that and any other microbes that are going to get in there. Every time you open something, the wine's got to come out, so something's got to get in there to displace it, whether it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not a vacuum or else these cubic tanks would be um, <laughs> much tighter. Um, so when we, when we pull that off, we want to make sure we're keeping it as clean as possible um, we don't want to have to intervene in the wines. Um, I used to be a brewer, which was a much lower alcohol product. And the only preservatives in beer were alcohol and hops. And so we had to be a lot more careful, I think, than, than wineries need to be because the alcohol level is higher. So you've kind of got that natural preservative in there, but, um, you just don't want to invite anything unwanted or unintended end of the wine. Uh, Patrick, is that fair? I mean, I pretty much just do what Patrick tells me usually anyway. You know, you, uh, you're, that, which is always a good, good start. Uh, <laughs> that is, uh, um, no, it is, it's mostly for clean. It's mostly for cleanliness. And for, as Steve mentioned, the, the, the primary uh, function of the alcohol there is to minimize fruit flies and, and bacteria build up on the valves. But that's really, that's really the minimize, you know, as far as, as Steve mentioned also, you know, one other thing he didn't say, but the pH is very much, much lower than beer. And so you have, uh, you know, lower, there's, a, there's a, only a handful of microbes that can ruin things in wine. There's handfuls of handfuls of things that can ruin things in beer. And so uh, that's that's the shortest of it. There's um, one other question that, that um, uh, looks like uh, uh, Simone is no longer, it's now Simon apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so on a serious note, there's connection. Is there a connection to extended MO and the fact that we had an early harvest? And um, go, go Dodgers, go Lakers, Simon. The uh, go Dodgers, go Lakers for sure. Wow, that's amazing. LA is, is kicking it right now for sure. Uh, but uh, yeah. so it was an early harvest, uh, Simon. But it was also an early start, and so the harvest was not that much earlier than uh, than I expected based on the starting 
date, and moreover, the flowering date. That's really the kind of the timer start for flowering. And so the flowering is X day, you know, at, you know, X number of days later, 180 or so many days down the road, you're going to get that grape is coming in. So that worked out to about the time frame that we expected. It was a little bit weird weather uh, and during August, um, but um, but most things that, uh, you know, probably 80 uh, 80 percent or something or so of the fruit that came in, came in kind of as I expected. It was an early harvest, though. If it was an early harvest because we harvested because we had to harvest early, then then there would be higher levels of malic acid and it would take indeed take longer for ML to complete. But but ML levels were no higher than this year. They were normal levels. So they um, there was not an um, there won't be, I don't think, an extended ML uh, for any wines. Other it should be a normal year as far as the time frame starting from post press or post, you know, pick to to uh to ml and thank you patrick and i think uh that actually brings me to a point that uh i'm gonna go ahead and contribute that uh two weeks from tonight november 11th it's a wednesday it's also veterans day um you can chime in here on the same webinar and learn all about ml which patrick just referenced malolactic uh malic acid but uh but, but malolactic conversion are also known as secondary fermentation for still wines. Um, and uh, Sue, are you, you have anything else? Or Patrick, you have anything else? I, I was going to otherwise kind of bring it home and we'll totally stay on the line and answer more questions. I know there's a few more here um, that we've gotten that, that uh, I just don't want to keep anybody up past their bedtime because I know everybody's got an imaginary friend to get back to. So I would just say the three things. So just know that wine style is everything. When, if you are a person making wine, you want to be aware of your bias. Do you want your wine to be light, elegant, and restrained? Do you want your wine to be big, bold, and powerful, or somewhere in the middle? And I think that's kind of cool what we do with Anarchists. Our, one of our brands is we have our, our whites and rosés really dialed back, crisp, clean, focused, and the reds kind of uh, kind of strutting their stuff a little bit. And, but if you are aware of your bias, it helps us make the wine uh, kind of really nail what you're looking for in terms of style. And then the other two big takeaways, again, extended maceration, keeping reds on the skin in order to shape the palate, not better, shape the palate differently. And we're going to do different things depending on the different varietals we're working with. And then finally, this bad boy sitting behind me. We use a bladder press, we inflate, and we're really paying attention to those different <clears throat> press fractions, free run, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. As we approach 0 0.8, one bar, we have to be really vigilant because as Patrick was talking about before, then we don't want to be breaking the seeds and potentially extracting bitterness or really harsh tannins that come from those seeds into the wine. So you're always testing those, tasting and testing through sensory analysis, those press fractions. All right, so I've, I've got a uh, big time whopper of a question here for Patrick. We're gonna have, we're gonna have a tete to tete here. Um, so <laughs> we've got uh, the 2018 Grape Grower of the Year. By the way, Steve Moulds is on here. Um, so hi, Steve, hi, Betsy. I'm sure Betsy's there with you. Hi, Hayden and Reed, if you guys are there as well. Um, so uh, Steve owns this amazing property. And Betsy, we did a, a highlight on it many months ago. Um, it's in the Oak Knoll District, Mold's Family Vineyard. Um, some of the best Cabernet you will ever see it come out of Napa. So no joke. But here's the serious question. No joke. Patrick, I'm kicking this to you because I'm totally not qualified to answer the question. Can you tell us the difference in impact of the resulting wine from viticulture versus winemaking? Really, Steve? Great you question. had to. Uh, <laughs> in this case, well, I think in this case, I mean, the normally, are, I, normally I you say, would say really the growers Steve, are overrated, though, Patrick. Wouldn't you that like the growers are typically kind of the most overrated part? Like the good wine starts in the winery. Yeah, they're really farming has nothing to that do old, with it for the most that part. That old adage. <laughs> so really, this is kind of like, can you solve world peace in the next thirty seconds? Go. <laughs> And uh, like, hmm, wow. 
This is a, that is a really good one, Steve. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the softball question there. Um, so that's a that's an excellent question. It's, it's, so the, his question was, uh, and it is, is basically how much impact does grape growing have, and how much does wine making have, and not so much to compete necessarily versus uh, one versus the other. It's just to understand all the aspects that, that affect the final wine, and so. It's an excellent question, and, and we can spend, I could probably spend, you know, um, you know, a year to try it or more to try to even attempt to answer the question and uh, I still don't. Well, what, 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 about, what about just a, a broad stroke? What about a broad stroke response, though? Because there, there oh. are differences, right? So no doubt about it. Oh, massive. No it. Yeah. So, I mean, so, I mean, again, so this is, this is, a, it's a great question, particularly so. If you are, uh, and it really helps if you're doing, um, if you're doing experiments to have like one, one type of farming system, you know, and, and done with different winemakers, so that you can really see what the, the impact of the winemaker was of the same grapes done to different people, or the same, or the same, uh, um, or, the, or vice versa, you know, the same winemaker working with different grapes that came from the same vineyard, or whatever. So, I think that farming, I, most winemakers that are trying to come off as even remotely humble. Always put it on the grape grower at grapes and, <clears throat> and say, you know, it's all 90% or 80% or usually it's more than 50. You know, uh, some of the maybe the longer you do it, go it's 49%, 51% grape growing. You know, uh, I think that there's it's 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 a huge amount on the grape side, and uh, whatever that number is, I'm not certain of it. But the, uh, the in broad strokes, you know, the more you um, you take you, you take into your, uh, care of the grapes, you know, the, the better the, the quality the, the grapes are going to be, obviously. So, I think. No, it's making, a, go ahead. Go, go, no, it's just it's it's. I mean, really, I think it's a symbiotic relationship, right? So it's whether it's 50, 50 splitting hairs, fifty one, forty nine, or whatever. I don't um, think it matters so much the number of percentage it is, but um, right. I, but I do think that the great, the farming, um, and you know, not just the farming, but the. the the choice of the plant of which clone that you're doing and, and you know how tall you're going to grow the plants and i mean which is part of the farming you know where which direction you're, you're going across and, and how much leaves you're going to leave and how much canopy all the aspects that go into it i think that uh now you know obviously once you're handed over to the winemaker there is a huge amount of decisions to make as well or to not make and so there is a quite a bit and i i think unfortunately the answer depends so i'd say my <laughs> winemaker I know this sounds like I'm a politician. I, I, I like to think in my winemaking that the grape grown is more important than me. That's what I'm trying, you know, and it's not just because I'm not trying to be answer. important. But I, I would like to think that that's the case, is that I'm not trying to, to do too much more than what the grapes are already kind of presenting to me. But a lot of winemakers say well, you, that. And so I don't know well, that you I'm can't doing make, that. So you, you yeah, can't I mean, make I, a grape wine with good grapes, right? You just can't do it. You, you need... Uh, you need exquisite fruit to really make a world worthy wine. And there's a reason why Mold's family vineyard were the 2018 growers of the year, right? Like they're counting the leaves on each shoot um, to get the right balance of photosynthesized capabil right. capabilities for each of those clusters. So, um, yeah, so, so, yeah. So I, yeah I, I think I, I, sorry, sorry, Patrick, go ahead. That's okay. I was going to say, Steve is going to be super, super humble as well. He says, we, we like to say we take the gates through high school and deliver them to you for college. And so uh, the, uh, I'm not sure I'm serious enough for college, but the, I definitely appreciate the, them having such good learning to that point to be able to work with us. As, as Steve Ryan mentioned, those grapes that you work with are incredible. And so it really helps so to make great wine when you have incredible grapes and you can just make you know do the right steps on the winemaking side too and then and it's way easier though than trying to do a bunch of magic on the grapes to make them well, something they're not yeah but i i think so my my understanding of it and and granted i'm more of an operator i certainly don't have the artistry that uh patrick has in this um i do have some scientific background but as an operator i see it really as a symbiotic relationship to where like if there if there if there's a fantastic farmer their fruit's always going to be elevated above everybody else. And whether it's a great vintage or not, that's, if it's a great vintage, the winemaker, he gets to have, he or she gets to have a, an easier vintage. If it's a very difficult vintage, 
mother nature gives you a difficult vintage, the winemaker might have to do a little bit more work. And so, but at the end of the day, if you don't have the right winemaker, you could have the best fruit in the world and the winemaker is going to, you know, just send it all to pot. Sorry, I tried to choose my words carefully. Uh, <laughs> they're not, you know, like, but you could have great fruit and a mediocre or poor winemaker and, and the wine will still be absolutely, you know, it'll, it'll deliver on something. But like to Patrick's point, it's not going to be a, a world worthy wine. It's not going to be a Napa Valley wine. Is that fair, Patrick? I think that's fair. Yeah, it, it really, um, farming to me is, I farming is the, farming is the, is the, is the most important. I mean, it really is. Uh, yeah. but, but unless you're something that, unless, again, now if you, if I was to do, uh, or whoever, whoever the, you know, the winemakers to make a decision was to do a lot of different things on them, on the grapes. And then, uh, depending on what those results were and how it impacted, I guess, how, now if you did a bunch of different things and they weren't that impacting, then it wouldn't have obviously a huge impact, but, but if they were, you, you know, whether it depends on if that was a positive thing or not, and that's a judge on, you have to decide. And so some wines I think are, I, I, a lot of the winemakers, a lot of the wines that I prefer, I just have to say this way, it seemed like the winemakers didn't do a lot or tried not to do a lot and just kind of bought nice barrels. And uh, which is, a, which is what I attempt to do. But a lot of winemakers like to impart their way on the grapes and to kind of do a lot of products and to do a lot of um, steps. And that's, that's, you can tell that, you know, that they were doing a lot. Now, again, if that's something that impresses you, I think you'll like that. Uh, and so. Uh, Frankenwine. It could be, or it could be, you know, some, there are a lot of, there's a lot of famous wines out there. The, the winemaker is very aggressive on the wines. Sure. And I, I can, I won't mention them right here on, on this, but I can tell you individually. National television? Uh, exactly. You, yeah. No. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to point out we're on national television right now. I, I kept Thank my, you. I kept it myself. I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, first of all, uh, I think there may be a couple of the questions coming in and um, we'll get to those after we stop recording. I think your phone may have just blitzed out. Um, but what we will we'll stay on after this, but we're going to shut off the recording. And so just as a matter of fact, we're going to round it up real quick. So we've got two different virtual events coming up two weeks from tonight. Wednesday, November 11th is our final installment, also known as the fourth installment of Wine Foundry Wednesday's Crush Camp. Woo! And uh, that was I, I shouldn't do that anymore. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Teresa was doing a dance behind the camera and I followed suit and it was not a attractive thing to do for me. Um, that's going to be all about oak barrels, oak barrel selection and malolactic conversion. So we're going to get really kind of geeky, but actually we're going to continue talking about wine style. Uh, November 18th, which for those of you without a calculator is a week later than November 11th. We have a uh, book group, the Wine Foundry Book Club. Um, and doing a great book called The Initiates. And I can let Stu give you a chime in on that in a second. But the cool thing about this is it's actually a graphic novel. It basically is a cartoonist and a winemaker that traded jobs a little bit, and then they wrote a graphic novel about it. Um, so I, I think it's super cool. I need, to, I need to buy it. I have, in all honesty, I haven't bought it yet. Um, but and I need to read it really quickly. Um, however, very cool. Stu, you want to give a more glowing recommendation for the book than I just gave? <laughs> Uh, I cannot, I cannot top your, since Steve hasn't bought the book nor read it. I mean, uh, that, that, that's, that's his devotion to literacy. Um, but the, it really is a fascinating thing. As Steve kind of said, uh, a, a graphic novel artist approached the winemaker and said, Hey, I want to learn about winemaking. I'll teach you about the art of comics. And it is all depicted in here. And they get into farming practices, uh, winemaking philosophy, which dictates that thing we were referring to, wine style, something called biodynamics. Um, it's a really fascinating dive into these different worlds. And since I don't really know anything about comics, I wasn't really necessarily skeptical, but I was like, okay, is this going to actually give uh is there going to be any credibility in terms of the graphic novel approach 
and in terms of winemaking, and hands down it is. So it's called uh, The Initiates by Etienne uh, Davido. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, and uh, and uh, Heather Parks was in uh, last week's book group, and she chimed in with a question tonight. Um, so I recommend uh, turn off the TV for just a little while um, and, uh, and, and explore some new literacy skills. And I'd like to state for the record, and, and I'm, we pro, drink I'm pro-literacy. Too. I'm pro-literacy, right down the line. He doesn't, he, he doesn't even read 20 minutes a day with Marlo. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Who's Marlo? Um, I, and on that note, now that we're going to put this up on YouTube for my daughter to see forever, um, <laughs> thank you guys all for joining us. we got one more week of these, and then we'll take a break for the holidays. We do uh, welcome any input from... Uh, we, we have a lot of different folks on here. I know we have growers on here. We have clients on here. We have other winemakers on here. And I've also seen uh, some of the folks that are kind of checking us out to see if they want to make wine as well. And just people that maybe, well, I have no idea what bucket you fall into, but I'm sure you fall into a great bucket. And if you have an idea for another session for when we come back in the late winter or so to do some more virtual programming, we'd love to hear it. Um, we'll, we'll definitely be exploring blends and bottling and we'll, we'll keep going down the road a little bit. Um, so if you have a suggestion, send it to make wine at the winefoundry.com. We'll put it on the list. We appreciate everything. We're going to stop the recording now, but we'll stay on to answer some questions. Thank you all so much. So very much from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, harvest is, is, uh, you know, the, the sun is setting on harvest a little bit and, uh, it's another vintage in the books and thanks for joining us. Cheers. <laughs>